Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Nicholas Residential Live Webinar and Q&A session with CrowdStreet. My name is Megan Gloka, Manager of Marketplace Operations here at CrowdStreet. Today, I am pleased to have Paul Panza, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, who will discuss the Bellevue at Sheraton Apartments offering on the CrowdStreet Marketplace. After the short presentation, we will open it up for questions. At this time, all participants will be in listen-only mode. If you have a question during the presentation or the Q&A, please type it into the questions box and we will ask it on your behalf. And with that, I'll let Paul take it away. Thank you, Megan. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. My name is Paul Panza. I'm president and CEO and founder of Nicholas Residential. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the company, Nicholas Residential is headquartered in Dallas, Texas. We are a fully integrated real estate investment firm with an exclusive focus on acquiring and renovating Class B multifamily assets across the Southwest. We have a very defined investment criteria that we operate within, and we do not deviate from that criteria. We do not buy office, retail, industrial, student, or senior housing. We are strictly focused on the affordable workforce housing space, which we believe to be a severely underserved segment of the market. Nicholas Residential looks for acquisitions of a minimum 200 units and at least 20 million in total capitalization. Tulsa is a little bit on the smaller end for us, but compelling reasons for us to get involved in the transaction. Um, typically, we are looking for deals that are geographically located in excellent submarkets across the Southwest, with our primary portfolio being held between Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston, Texas. We are looking for properties located next to strong local and regional employment centers, as well as major thoroughfares that provide access to the metropolitan area for tenants. We also look for opportunities with some sort of an efficiency play. Um, we buy deals from the smaller syndicated equity shops all the way up to the larger institutions, the CWSs, the Starwoods, the Lone Stars, and the Blackstones. And regardless of who we're buying from, we want to identify some sort of an efficiency. And that efficiency could be as simple as implementing an institutional property management platform, which we have in-house um, on some of the smaller deals, or scraping the bottom of the barrel for that low-hanging fruit that the larger institutions don't look for. Things like additional covered parking, valet trash, extended backyards, uh, washer dryer leaseback programs. Th these programs are, are not unique to Nicholas, but it's something that you'll find in common throughout our entire portfolio. Today, uh, Nicholas Residential manages and owns a portfolio of roughly $400 million worth of multifamily assets across the Southwest, um, right at 5,000 units. In our history, we have bought and sold uh, right around $800 million, so just under a billion dollars, um, 8,000 units, all Class B value-add multifamily, all located in the Southwest. So we've been doing this for a long time, and it has our complete and utmost focus. Um, prior to founding Nicholas Residential, I was managing director of U.S. real estate and partner at Westmount Realty Capital, uh, where I founded the joint venture multifamily equity platform. So I've had the benefit of working on both sides of the business, um, first as an analyst at Jones Lang LaSalle, and then later on the joint venture equity side, providing equity to sponsors like Nightvest Capital, Madera, Presidium. Um, built up that portfolio to a $200 million, 4,000 unit uh, portfolio and sold that business and parlayed that capital into what Nicholas Residential is today. Um, Nicholas Residential also owns our property management and construction management companies, Bellevue Realty Management and Bellevue Construction Management. Bellevue Realty Management is our in-house property manager. It services only Nicholas Residential owned properties. We do not do any third-party management. So the assets that we own get 100% of our attention. Uh, my partner, Josh Vandenberg, who's not on the call today, is Executive Vice President of Bellevue Management. Josh has 15 years of experience in the industry. He grew up in the business and in a former life oversaw a portfolio of 35,000 units. 
which is the direction that we are heading with this platform. So uh, very fortunate to have Josh. Below Josh, for each market area that we are active, whether it's Houston or Oklahoma, we have a regional vice president who oversees those assets. Uh, we also have a maintenance director and a construction manager. The maintenance director's job is to make sure that our work orders are being fulfilled within 24 to 48 hours, so our tenants stay happy and our retention rates stay high. Our construction manager's job is to make sure that we're turning units. If you look at Nicholas Residential's underwriting, one of the things you'll notice is that we err on the side of caution. Um, that may be a function of having worked on the other side of the business, on the joint venture side for, for many, many years, um, but we tend to underwrite our deals with um, a fair amount of extra room because inadvertently things never go 100% according to plan. Um, so we use very little market rental growth to achieve our returns. Instead, the majority of our return profile is predicated on our value add improvement program. I'll talk about what that looks like. Um, but if we don't have at least 200 units and if we can't turn those units at a certain velocity, we're not able to achieve our returns. And so the reason we have a dedicated construction manager for each submarket location uh, is so that we are, are keeping that turn velocity up on units. Typically, it takes us anywhere from three to five days uh, to completely turn a unit, whether that's a typical R&M package or whether we're going in with a tier one or a tier two value add improvement package. On average, we turn anywhere from 10 to 12 units a month. Um, the national average for multifamily turnover is about 50%. We can accelerate or decelerate our turnover average with our rental premiums. In other words, if we need to accelerate turnover, we can raise rents. If we need to decelerate turnover, we can keep rents the same. And that's one of the ways that we're able to maximize and control that velocity at each one of our properties. Um, Tulsa is a unique opportunity for us. As I mentioned, it's a little bit of a smaller deal than what we would typically go after, but there's a good backstory. Tulsa was part of an eight property portfolio that's being sold by a group called MC Companies. Um, MC Companies uh, has some uh, management efficiencies that maybe they are not completely focused on, and they had broken up these eight assets city by city. And there were two deals in Oklahoma. Uh, one of them is called 81 Sheridan. The other one is 101 Sheridan. We could not get comfortable with the underwriting for the second deal. So despite the fact that MC wanted to sell these as a portfolio, we stayed very firm. Um, what you'll notice about Nicholas Residential is we are conservative in our underwriting, but aggressive in our ability to go out and put deals under contract because we are not bound by the confines of a fund and we have our own balance sheet. What does that mean? That means that we can put up significant amounts of corporate capital day one as hard money. In today's market, surety of close to a seller, whether it's an individual or a syndication group or a family or an institution, surety of close their amount to price. So, we have oftentimes seen discounted purchase prices on deals that we are awarded um, simply because we are willing to take the most risk up front. How do we get comfortable with that? We get comfortable with that by doing the majority of our due diligence from day one. Um, so whether we are walking units, and I'll talk a little bit about what our DD process looks like later on the call, uh, but whether we're walking units, looking at roofs, looking at foundations, looking at water pumps for ponds or pools, we get comfortable with the amount of work that needs to be done before we put up that best and final offer. So we can feel comfortable offering two, three, four hundred thousand, all the way up to two million on some of our larger transactions as hard money day one, as a way of essentially buying the price down of those assets and in exchange for the discount, providing that surety of close for the seller. This deal was a, a great example of that. We put up a substantial amount of hard money day one. We offered a shortened feasibility period. In other words, a shortened due diligence period. Typically, these real estate deals, they'll offer a what's called a 30-30. So a 30-day look or 30-day diligence, and then a 30-day close. So there's some initial escrow money that goes up, 30 days to diligence the property, 
and then we put some more escrow money up in 30 days to close. Uh, by putting up hard money day one, cutting our diligence period to 21 days, again, gives the seller a little bit more comfort that this group is for real. They're going to close the deal at the agreed upon price. Nicholas also has a very good reputation in the market um, from small local regional sellers all the way up to the national powerhouses for doing what we say we're going to do, for closing deals, for closing deals on time, and for closing deals at the agreed upon price. Real estate, like many other industries, is a relationship business. So being able to maintain that reputation in the market means that we have access to deals and deal terms that other groups do not. So lo and behold, we were able to secure just the asset we wanted. It turns out there was somebody out there in the world who only wanted the other property. So very fortunate for us, we were able to walk away with just 101 Sheridan, which is the property that we really wanted at what we feel is a very attractive price of 16250000 or 63000 just over per unit. It's a very attractive cost basis, both from a cap rate perspective and from a price per pound. Uh, being very active in the Dallas and Houston markets, deals like this routinely trade uh, for sub five caps, right? So in, in key markets in Dallas, Plano, Frisco, Coppell, Colleyville, Carrollton, you're seeing 80s vintage class B deals trade in the four and a half to four and three quarter range. Um, on a T12 basis, we're going into this deal with the increased income at about a 5.6% cap. Uh, we've underwritten a 6% cap at exit. So we're giving ourselves a little bit of room, understanding that we are living in an inflationary environment. How do we mitigate those risks on the debt side? Well, the debt is a 10-year agency loan, okay? Through Freddie Mac, uh, there are four years interest only. So we've got a 10-year loan, four years IO, with a spread somewhere in the 170 to 175 range above the 10-year which will put us all in somewhere in the 4.7 to 4.75 range. When that rate is locked and the spread has already been locked, um, that means that we have that debt at that rate for the next 10 years. The benefit of Fannie and Freddie loans is that they are fully assumable and they are eligible to be resized back to 75 or 80%, depending on the submarket. In Tulsa, it's 80%. Um, when they are assumed and eligible for that supplemental. So our investment thesis is fairly simple. It's been the same for the past three years. It's that we're living in an inflationary environment. Rates have been low for a very long time. In order to be able to have a fiscal policy that enables us to cut rates in the future, if we need to do that to strengthen the economy, we need to have rates at a higher point. And so that's why you've seen the Federal Reserve raised rates a little bit more quickly than we would have hoped. I think you saw rates go to 325 on the 10-year. People got a little spooked. Stock market dropped off. You saw rates come back down to the 315 range. And then we expect them to stabilize somewhere in the 310 to 315 over the next couple of months. But this time next year, I would not be surprised to see a 10-year rate at 3.5%. The benefit of having assumable debt is that when we sell this deal three to five years from now, the new buyer will be able to assume this loan at the current rate. They'll be able to use a supplemental loan at market, and together the blended cost of that debt, the blended cost of capital, will be well below market, which creates some value for us upon the exit. Um, beyond the cost basis and the debt financing, this deal was extremely attractive to us uh, because of the returns that it generates with very conservative underwriting. Many of you have noticed that we're, we're not using full leverage on this deal. We're using 68% loan to value. If, you, if you've ever worked on deals with an institution like an insurance company, you'll, you'll know that they want to use debt somewhere in that 65% range because it's safer. So we're using 68% leverage. As of today, rents at the property are 85 cents a foot, about $670 a month. Tulsa and Oklahoma City are one of the last true bastions of affordability in the Southwest United States. Where else can you get a one-bedroom, 80s Class B vintage apartment 
for $670 a month. It doesn't exist. So at 85 cents a foot, we're roughly nine cents a foot below our competitive market set that has various levels of improvements. That's about $120 a month, okay? Uh, in our pro forma, we've, we've assumed a $75 rental premium, okay? So well below the competitive market set based off of our $3,500 or $896,000 capital expenditure program. In other words, we're investing $3,500 per unit. We're looking for a $75 premium. We shoot for typically a minimum 30% return on investment. I think that we'll exceed those numbers, but the point that I'm trying to make is that with 68% leverage, okay, with an exit cap that is 50 to 60 basis points higher than where we're going in, with a below market rental premium, okay, this deal still generates a 10% cash on cash on average over the five-year hold and an 18% IRR. So every dollar that we get above that is accretive to the total return. We have not underwritten washer dryer income. We have not underwritten extended backyard income or valet trash or additional covered parking or a bump to market rates. None of that additional income has been underwritten. One of the things that we, we love about this property, number one is that the interiors are original. Um, most of you are very familiar with this market and, and you're familiar with CrowdStreet. You're seeing deals trade. Very, very seldom do you see a class B 80s deal with original interiors, right? Most of the transactions have been picked over. They've been improved to a various point. Uh, that limits the amount of true value add that you can add to these deals. So we like the fact that there's original interiors. The second thing that is critical to us um, in this market is that 100% of the units have full-size washer-dryer connections. Anytime you approach or exceed a dollar a square foot in rent, I don't care what market you're operating in, tenants want a full-size washer-dryer in their units. They do not want to use a laundry facility. So we tend to shy away from deals that don't have the connections because there's no return on investment. Installing a washer-dryer connection costs anywhere from $2,500 to $3,000 if you're lucky. Then you've got to supply the washer dryers, but there's no payback on the connections, just like there's no payback on putting a brand new roof on a property, right? We want to focus our capital expenditure dollars on items that are accretive to us and to our investors. So we look to deals that have limited deferred maintenance. We look at the roofs. We look at the foundations. We like to see hardy plank siding. Um, on occasion, we'll repaint the exterior of a property, we'll do some landscaping, we'll put some lipstick on the leasing office, we'll build out a fitness center, but nine times out of 10, 85% of our total CapEx budget is spent on interiors. Why? Because that's what generates the largest return on investment. Plank flooring and appliances, far and away, the number one ROI item from an interior improvement standpoint. Beyond that, countertops, cabinet fronts, hardware, brush nickel aluminum appliances, gooseneck faucets, undermount sinks, forward two-inch blinds, lighting and fan packages, two-tone paint. This is the typical package for a Nicholas residential deal. Um, we have two tiers, and having two tiers of improvements allows us to test the market. We have our tier one package, which is what I just described. It's the flooring, it's the Formica countertop, it's the Formica cabinet front, it's the gooseneck faucet, it's the two-tone paint, it's the black appliances, it's the forward two-inch blinds and the lighting. That package cost us anywhere from 2700 to call it $3,000 a unit, depending on the size and the location. Then we have a tier two package. And what you'll typically see from us is that we like to create a story for the next buyer. The deals that have been incredibly successful in the market today have a value add story. In other words, we'll do 80% of the property at a level one improvement package. We'll do 5% at a level two to prove the market, and then we'll leave 15% original. Our tier two package consists of everything that I've mentioned, but it has the addition of granite countertops, pre-cut granite, undermount sinks, tile backsplash, and aluminum appliances. 
We don't use the stainless steel because they're too expensive. Um, and the faux stainless or the aluminum show just as well. And they're both about the same durability. Nowhere near as durable as all black appliances, um, but about the same when compared to one another. That package costs us anywhere from 3800 to 4000 per unit. How are we able to control costs? Well, we own the construction company. So 90% of the work that's done to unit interiors is done by our staff. So there's no additional cost. We are not outsourcing that work. The only time we outsource capital expenditure items are for major capital expenditure repairs, things like roofs, things like siding replacement, things like exterior paint and landscape. It doesn't make sense for us to keep someone on staff to do that. It's not cost efficient. Everything else is done in-house. That means that 17 to 22% margin that you would see a general contractor take out of, out of that cost stays in the deal. Okay, so that's a bonus to investors. The second thing we do is we have our own procurement business. So through an institutional equity partner of ours, we have a direct supply chain to Hong Kong. Um, we are able to sec secure full wood plank flooring for somewhere between a dollar and a dollar oh eight per square foot uh, because we buy in bulk. We buy enough for a thousand units at a time. Um, that is substantially below market cost today, tariffs included. Okay, labor, material, those costs are only going to continue going up. So we're able to control that by having our own supply and distribution chain. Same thing with granite. We have pre cut granite that we order in chunks of 250 units at a time directly from Hong Kong. Um, it's pre cut to fit the individual units. We have a granite cutter on staff that will kind of slice and dice those last couple of millimeters off because every unit, even though it's the same floor plan, is just a little bit different. Um, but we do the undermounting of the sinks. All of that's done in-house. So again, that margin on the procurement side is a little bit larger, somewhere between 30 and 40% um, as opposed to going through one of the major suppliers uh, stateside for these products. We keep that margin in-house. Um, but last but not least on the debt side, we do a tremendous amount of business with the agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and with our loan origination firms, Northmark Capital and Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, because of that, we, we routinely get discounted pricing depending on the size of the loan. This is a little bit of a smaller loan, uh, so I think we're paying 80, 80 basis points, but market for a, a debt origination is a point. Um, so we are able to pass those savings along to our investors. And so the partnership benefits from the tremendous amount of volume that we do as a company. Um, we like the Tulsa market for a number of reasons. First and foremost, yield. Um, I mentioned it's one of the last bastions of affordability. People need a place to live. It's one of the reasons that we've built our company on this premise that Affordable and workforce housing is an extremely underserved segment in the market. Teachers, uh, nurses that work in the hospital that are not doctors, military, service, retail, hospitality, people that make the world go round, they need a place to live and they need it within their city. And what's happening is you're seeing all this new development at $1.65 to $3 a foot here in Dallas for some of the new apartment complexes. People keep getting pushed further and further outside their neighborhoods, right? They have a more difficult time getting to work. Dallas and Houston in particular don't have the best public transportation system. So there's an impact to that. There's an impact on, on, on the employees and the tenants and their families, but there's also an impact on the businesses in the city. Um, and so one of the things that, that Nicholas Residential seeks to do is we, we look to add some value back into the communities that we're investing in. We are looking to generate a return for our investors, but we're also looking to provide safe, affordable, best-in-class housing and services for our tenants. Um, that's one of the reasons that we, we tout the Bellevue brand. Uh, we are building that brand name recognition and brand name loyalty, very similar to what you would see from a Gables or a Gray Star in the Class A space. When you drive by a Gables property, it comes with a certain look and feel. There's an expectation for the quality and the service that you're going to get. Uh, same thing with Graystar. 
But there is no gray star of workforce housing. There's no gables of the affordability space. And so by and large, that's what we're building. We see Tulsa and Oklahoma City as tremendous yield markets, uh, buying for 63 a door assets that would cost 90, 100 a door in Dallas or Houston, tremendous advantage to us. And again, being able to generate the returns that we're able to generate to our LPs, um, 17, 18% returns, two plus multiples on three to five year holds with very conservative assumptions, this is our bread and butter. Um, I've said this many, many times. There's a lot of places investors can put their money, but we are focused on risk-adjusted return. We're talking stabilized Class B multifamily assets in great locations. This particular area of Tulsa, the average income within a one-mile radius is $126,000. The Jenks School District that services this property is one of the top three school districts in Oklahoma. Single family home prices range from 400,000 to $2 million. So you're talking about the best of the best sub markets, the best of the best neighborhoods. That's where we put our money. That's how we mitigate the downside risk. And to be able to generate high teams returns and current cash flow with that kind of underwriting on that kind of asset, those are the deals that we're focused on. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Great, thank you. Um, so I just want to remind investors that if you have a question, please do type it into the box and we will go ahead and ask it on your behalf. So let's start out with uh, one of our first questions. Paul, can you tell us more about the washer dryer lease back program? Sure, so Nicholas Residential in, in, in Bellevue, really this, this runs through Bellevue Management has a relationship with a, a supplier overseas uh, that allows us to purchase in bulk uh, full-size washer dryers for about $650 in total. We lease those back to tenants for $35 a month. Um, if we're not doing it, tenants are gonna go to appliance warehouse and they're gonna lease them for $40 a month. So we would rather keep that return, which is a over a 50% return annualized. We'd rather keep that return in the partnership. Um, and so that's an initial outlay of capital that we're paid back over the course of less than two years. Great. Um, sorry, I just uh, accidentally lost uh, the question. <laughs> Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your due diligence process? Sure. So Nicholas Residential, um, despite the fact that we're a, a middle market firm in terms of you know, assets under management, um, we apply an institutional approach to due diligence. So uh, when Josh and the rest of the management team, our construction managers, our maintenance directors, our regional vice presidents, walk the property, we walk 100% of the units. Um, we have a software program that allows us on the individual iPads to categorize the condition of every single unit that we walk. Um, so everything from flooring to countertop material to appliances to lighting, um, it's one of the ways we build our capital expenditure budget. So at the end of the day, on a property like Tulsa, we've walked all 256 units. We have itemized every single material from flooring to lighting, top to bottom, and we're able to sort that data into actionable data uh, so that we can put together a really finely tuned capital expenditure budget and know for this percentage of units, we're using a plank flooring, it's gonna cost us X, the yield is gonna be $50. Um, for this percentage of units, we're going to be purchasing upgraded lighting and Formica countertops, uh, the cost is X, uh, the improvement's going to be about $12.50 a month. So it enables us to really drill down and put together an institutional level capital expenditure program where we know exactly what we're spending for every unit and we know exactly what kind of a rental premium we can expect from those improvements. Beyond just the property level diligence that goes through, you know, the roofs and the foundations, boilers, water heaters, pond pumps, 
Um, we're also looking at lease audits. So we audit every single lease for every single property that we purchase. We're looking at, does the income match the pay stub? Has employment been verified? Is there that two and a half X multiplier on the rent versus their income? Where do these folks work? And that way, once we have that data, we're able to sort that data, not only to better understand our tenant base, but it also means we're able to more efficiently allocate marketing dollars. For example, if we recognize that, hey, 10% of the property has a common area of employment, that means we're able to better allocate our marketing dollars to generate qualified foot traffic and keep, keep occupancy high at our properties. Thank you. Uh, and this is a technical question. Can you tell us if Jared and TUL Investors LLC is a Texas or a Delaware LLC? It sounds like there might be a couple exhibits that, that are different. Uh, Sheridan Tulsa Investors, the property level owner, is a Delaware LLC. Um, the general partner member entities are Texas LLCs. Excellent. And um, is Sheridan TUL, I'm sorry, <clears throat> when do you anticipate the first distribution and what percent would it start at? So Nicholas Residential, just as, as a, a general matter of business, does not make distributions in the first quarter of operations on a new transaction. This deal is scheduled to close on November 19th. Um, so December, January, February, we would expect the first distribution to be made at the end of March. Um, we like to start our distributions a little bit below what we estimate current cash flow to be. So I would anticipate them starting in the seven and a half percent range and then slowly scaling up to 10% over the first several quarters of operations. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit more about the economic drivers in the region and neighborhood and who the major employers are in the area? So Tulsa has a, a well-diversified economic base from education to healthcare to manufacturing and shipping. Um, so one of the things that we really like about the property is that there isn't any one employer uh, that makes up more than 10% of our total tenant base. So we've got some folks from the military, we've got some folks in education, we have several folks that work in the service and retail industries. So the vast majority are our local and regional employment centers that support this area of Tulsa. Thank you. Which is good um, because there's a certain amount of recession resistance in this particular area of the market. If you look at the history of 2008, 2009, 2010, Places like Dallas, uh, but particularly places like Tulsa, were very well insulated from that downturn. They experienced the least amount of decline, and they were also some of the first areas to bounce back. So something else that we're paying a lot of attention to. We tend to stay away from markets that were um, very hardly hit during the last economic downturn, the coasts in particular. Thank you. And can you talk a little bit more about the debt for the project? So loan is interest only for four years. What will the loan payments be in year five, and how will that impact the cash flows? Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know exactly what the loans will be in year five, but there is, there is an underwriting package uh, that has a five-year pro forma, so you can see the principal and interest amortization pick up in the fifth year. And obviously, you're going to see the cash flow go down, um, in year five, but the benefit of having four years interest only is that we're piggybacking off of the additional income from our value add improvement program. So what you'll see is you'll see a, a cash flow over the first four years that steps up somewhere around one and a half to 2% per year based off of our improvement program. So by the time we get to year five, if we've been averaging 11% in year four, you'll see year five come down to about 10% which is, I think, exactly the way the pro forma is put together. Thank you. 
Can you tell us more about your relationship between North Northmark Capital and Nicholas Residential? So Northmark Capital is a direct to agency or a DUS lender. Okay. So there are there are many, many brokerage firms out there um, from Grand Bridge to JLL to Northmark. The vast majority of, of these lenders are truly brokers. And so they'll have to go through an agency with a Fannie or a Freddie license. Um, both Northmark and Jones Lang LaSalle have agency licenses, which means that they actually are the lender. So they are pri providing the debt directly to the deal. They're doing the underwriting. Um, they're doing the diligence on the assets. They're looking through the business plans. So Northmark Capital Finance is um, uh, it's one of the largest uh, real estate loan originators for the agencies in the country. We have a relationship that goes back with them uh, for nearly a decade. And in 2017, Nicholas Residential was one of the uh, top three providers for agency loans uh, through Northmark Capital, uh, through their Dallas office. And Northmark's Dallas office led the country in origination. So we have very, very strong relationships with the leadership at Northmark and sort of by association, very strong relationships with the leaders of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So we are a preferred borrower, which means that we are eligible for terms, pricing, um, certain underwriting exemptions, things like leverage uh, that other groups are unable to achieve. Great. Have you had any changes in property management at your other projects? And is your prop your in-house property management new to your organization? So Bellevue Property Management took over operations at our entire portfolio in April of 2018. So we manage all of our assets in-house, uh, which means we have complete control over the accounting process, over the personnel, over the business plans, and over the budgets. Um, that was something that was very important to me in my previous role uh, when I was a partner at Westmount. It's something that we didn't have, um, something that we didn't have for the first couple of years at Nicholas until we kind of hit that scale. But nowhere else uh, in the multifamily space is it more important uh, than in the Class B arena to control property management. The managers, the on-site staff, the maintenance team, the porters, those folks can make or break that property in 30 days. So it's critical that we are able to have the right team in place um, and that everybody's rowing the same direction. That's why vertical integration is so important. It's one of the reasons that we don't manage uh, third-party properties. We are focused exclusively on managing our own assets. And our goal is to provide best in class service for our tenants and best in class performance for our investors. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> Can you tell us what your performa assumptions were for concessions, vacancy, marketing, and payroll? Our payroll budget averages anywhere from $1,100 to $1,200 per unit. Um, I'm going to be honest, I have no idea what marketing is per unit in our pro forma. It's typically somewhere around 150, anywhere from 100 to $150 per unit, um, but that should be on the pro forma that's available online. Um, well, I'm sorry, what were the other assumption questions? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, concessions, vacancy, marketing, and payroll. Okay, so marketing and payroll we covered. Uh, concessions, typically on a property like this, we don't offer any concessions. Um, I think the more important metric would be bad debt. Um, in this sub-market, there are no concessions at present, um, so we don't, we don't anticipate providing any concessions. The property is 94% occupied, so there isn't a reason to offer any concessions. I think, again, the more important metric is bad debt. So you can be 100% occupied, um, and have bad debt of 20%, and your economic occupancy is 80%, and that makes it very difficult to run a property. How do you mitigate that? Well, you focus on qualifying your tenant base appropriately. 
It's one of the reasons that we go through an in-depth verification program from verifying employment, verifying income, doing a criminal background and a credit check. Um, as long as we can focus on bringing in qualified tenants into the property, bad debt for us typically stays below 2%. Um, but the problems that we've seen in the past with managers who are less focused on qualifying their tenant base is you'll see a quick rise in occupancy, um, but then you see that bad debt number start to creep up. And when bad debt creep up, that means evictions creep up. And evictions are expensive, right? So now you've kind of double whammied the partnership. Not only do you have people that aren't paying rent, but now you've got to go out and evict them and spend money to do that, right? So what we focus on from day one is making sure, one, the property we're taking over is properly qualified qualify their tenants, and two, making sure that any new residents that we're bringing in are properly qualified. So bad debt on a deal like this below 2%. Occupancy in the submarket is 94%, so we like to see somewhere in the 92, 93% pro forma. Great. Will you be keeping your current staff? We will not be keeping all of the current staff. Um, there are two individuals that um, have just kind of blown us away. One of them is a maintenance director. One of them is on-site leasing staff. Um, we are keeping both of them on-site at the property. We are bringing in a new property manager who has 15 years plus of experience managing assets in Tulsa. We'll also be uh, bringing in uh, one other leasing associate and we'll be bringing in uh, two additional folks outside, one on the maintenance side and turnover and a porter. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, your relationship with CrowdStreet and what leads you to use our platform? <laughs> sure. So my relationship with CrowdStreet goes back to uh, 2013. So um, in my former role at Westmount, uh, Westmount and, and CrowdStreet sort of pioneered the first really truly institutional crowdfunding deals. It was a deal called Westmount at Vista Ridge that we funded in, in 2010 and sold uh, several years later. But that was, that was sort of our introduction to the crowdfunding market, um, sort of when, when CrowdStreet was just beginning itself. So I've worked with the, with the founders, Darren and Ian, uh, for, gosh, 13, about, about six years now. Um, we've had, I don't know, countless deals, somewhere around 12, or 13 individual deals that have gone through the marketplace. Um, some of them have sold, some of them we still own, um, but we really sort of grew that space together. Um, it's something that we had a, a tremendous amount of interest in. I wrote my graduate thesis at the Cox School of Business on crowdfunding um, and the implications that that has on the capital markets as a whole and the opportunity for high net worth investors having access to direct uh, institutional real estate ownership, as opposed to what had previously been possible by investing through a REIT. So really for the first time in history, investors have an opportunity to come in and purchase a securitized interest in a real estate deal. So something that's still very new, even though it's been around for five years, we're still kind of working through what that looks like. We're working through educating investors on the process, how to look at deals, how to look at sponsorship, um, but it's something that we've been passionate about, something that we've been studying for a very long time. As a matter of fact, I, I teach an adjunct class at the Cox School of Business on real estate finance and crowdfunding, kind of focusing on those very topics. So we have a, a very, very long, long history with CrowdStreet. Thank you. Can you tell us about the experience of the management team? Sure. So uh, Josh Vandenberg is, is our executive vice president, my partner. Um, he is over all of Bellevue Realty Management. Josh has been in the business uh, since he could walk. His family business uh, was started in the late 80s by his father and uncle. At their height, they had 50,000 units across the nation. Um, several years ago, Josh was overseeing a portfolio of 35,000 units. He's operated across the Southwest. He's operated on the East and West Coast. Um, and he is a roll up your sleeves, get down and dirty kind of guy. Um, the thing that I love about Josh is that he has a, a tremendous amount of respect 
uh, both from and for our on-site property staff. Uh, he's a great educator. Um, and so the staff really look to him for that guidance. He is on-site at our properties pretty much all week, every week. He splits his time between uh, Dallas, Houston, and Oklahoma. So he's constantly on the road, uh, making sure that our on-site property management teams have everything they need to be able to do their job effectively. Uh, my CFO, Rachel Purcell, who is also over um, the Bellevue financial side of the business, uh, Rachel spent eight years in tax audit at Deloitte & Touche uh, before leaving to become the chief accounting officer of Tremel Crow Residential. Um, when they spun off Riverstone, she became chief financial officer of Riverstone, uh, then was chief financial officer of Mill Creek Residential Trust, which is a REIT, um, and later became chief financial officer of U.S. Residential Group. Um, she helped build U.S. Residential from 50,000 units to 200,000 units under management during her tenure. Um, so she has 25 years experience in the business. And Rachel is, you know, my counterpart here at the corporate office. She runs the finance audit and inside. We also have Debbie Burns. Uh, Debbie is a 15-year veteran from CWS. She is our regional vice president. Um, all of the on-site property managers report up through Debbie. Um, and Jesse Roach, who is our regional maintenance director. Jesse, we were fortunate enough to get from uh, a competitor. He's He's been someone that I've worked with on the joint venture side for many years. Jesse also has an educational background, um, HVAC certified technician, just a, a brilliant guy on site at the property. Again, uh, commands and gives a tremendous amount of respect. He's very well liked by the on-site staff um, and they really look up to him for that guidance. So um, from a leadership perspective, the Bellevue management team, I would, I would put up against any other property management firm out there. Great. What percentage of the property is one bedroom? Oh, gosh. You know, that, that'll be in the investment package. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. No problem. Do you know the interest rate on the senior debt? So the, the, the spread's going to be locked in in the 1.7 range. So we expect the final rate to be somewhere below 4.75%. Can you tell us a little bit more about your uh, underwritten operating expenses for management fees and payroll, et cetera? Uh, well, so, so Nicholas Residential, we don't take a whole lot of fees. So there's an initial acquisition fee, um, which depending on the size of the deal, we, we we're buying a, a $220 million REIT in Houston. Um, where the fee is is percentage basis points all the way up to some of the smaller deals. Um, our fee minimum is typically 250,000. I think it's a little bit below that on this deal um, because we didn't we didn't want to fee it to death, um, but we need to be compensated for guaranteeing the loan and, and taking the initial earnest money risk and putting the deal together. So we have our acquisition fee. We do not charge a disposition fee. We don't charge a loan guarantor fee. We take a three percent property management fee. Uh, which is at or below market, depending on the asset class and the group. Uh, and we take a 1% um, asset management fee on the deal. And those are the only fees that come back to Nicholas Residential. Um, back to the payroll, uh, payroll again is at that $1,100 to $1,150 per unit on, on our entire portfolio, Tulsa included. Uh, and for investors that might have missed it in the beginning, can you tell us what the annualized returns will be in years one through five? So that's that's all included in the pro forma. Um, annualized return in year one is seven and a half. We're up to nine percent in year two, uh, ten percent in year three, eleven percent in year four, and back to ten percent in year five. Thank you. Can you uh, talk about? what the exit will look like for investors and is it so, investable through an IRA? Yes, all of our deals are eligible for either a self-directed or an administered IRA. We work with Quest, Millennium, um, several of the self-administered IRAs. Uh, so that's 
that's not an issue for us or for the way the investment is structured. Um, what was the second question? The exit. What does the exit look yes. like? Yes, uh, exactly. So we've underwritten an exit cap um, that is currently above market today. Again, because we, like many others, believe we're living in an inflationary environment. Locking in long-term fixed rate debt should mitigate a lot of that um, because our interest rate on our loan will stay low. And that loan is fully assumable upon the exit. So there's, there's a great deal of attraction to having that long-term fixed rate debt. And that should help us add some value on the exit. Uh, but we've underwritten the 6% exit cap. This deal is going to trade to a syndicated equity group or a mid-sized family office. Uh, it is not going to sell to an institution. And that's a good thing. Um, there's a much larger buyer pool in these, um, you know, sort of um, high net worth syndication space, in the family office space, in the middle market private equity space. This deal will appeal to a much larger group of investors as opposed to, you know, a $65, $70 million transaction in Houston where your, your buyer pool is kind of limited due to the size of that transaction. So um, there should be a nice size buyer pool at sort of the middle market PE level for this deal. Great. Um, a couple of questions here. Uh, can you tell us what the average employ uh, I'm sorry, what the average commute time will be for a tenant and is the property fenced? If not, have you budgeted for it in your capital expenditures? Yeah, the property is fenced. Um, the gates work, but inevitably these rolling gates fail. People hit them. Um, and so that's something that we have a continuing R&M budget built in for fixing the fences and things like that. Um, I'm sorry, what was your other question? Average commute time for tenants. So, look, I mean, again, it's it, no one employer makes up more than 10% of, of the tenant base. So you have a commute time that ranges from people walking across the street. There's a tremendous amount of retail in this particular submarket. So you could run anywhere from a five-minute walk to a 15-minute drive. The benefit of this property is you're situated at the intersection nearly of Highway 64 and 364, which runs north and south and east and west through southeast Tulsa. Um, so very easy access to that major thoroughfare. So uh, for folks that have to jump on the highway, no more than a 15-minute commute. Great. Um, can you explain uh, how you manage properties across state lines? So it starts with having a great manager on site at the property. So that's kind of step one. Um, step two is having our regional director, our maintenance director, and Josh, our executive vice president, visiting those properties on an alternating basis every other week. So whether Debbie's up there one week and Josh is up there the next and Jesse's up there the next week, every single week there's a member of the corporate team on site at those properties. It's one of the reasons that we don't stretch too far outside of, of Texas. Uh, we'd like to be able to have very easy access. It's a three-hour drive or a 45-minute flight. So we're able to get up there very easily every week. How and when is your sponsor promote being paid? Well, the, the way the deal is structured, uh, it's a 10% preferred return pair of So all of the investors, whether they're on the GP side or the LP side, will receive a 10% preferred return pro rata. Okay, that's, those are the first dollars out of the deal. Everybody gets a 10 the next dollars out of the deal pay everyone's equity back again pro rata so if you put a hundred thousand dollars in the deal and you're in the deal for five years that's a ten percent investment on your hundred thousand times five that's fifty thousand dollars so you're getting a hundred and fifty thousand dollars back at the end of five years before there's any profit split before the sponsor gets a promote okay after the ten percent pref and the return of equity, the sponsor team gets 25% of that additional cash flow up to a 16% IRR. So we get a 15% promote between a 10 and a 16. Okay. Once the limited partnership has achieved a 16% IRR, 
the sponsorship team gets a 50% share of any of those last dollars, right? So it pushes the sponsorship team to drive that IRR to that 16% through operations so that we can participate in a larger share of whatever dollars are over at the end of the day. Thank you. And are your distributions paid monthly or quarterly? Um, on this deal, they're monthly. It, it, it typically depends. We work with, you know, high net worth investors. We work with family offices and we work with, um, you know, true institutional investors, pension funds, insurance companies. Typically with the larger groups, our, our distributions are paid quarterly. Um, on a, on a you know, smaller deal like this, where we're working with our high net worth investors, we, we know that monthly cash flow is important. And so this is a deal that will pay monthly distributions. Thank you. Can you explain how you get to your uh, 90000 a unit exit price? Well, it's a function of NOI and cap rate. Um, so the valuations on any real estate deal, but particularly multifamily, um, they're based on cap rate. Okay? And cap rate is a function of NOI. And so if we look at a $75 rental premium, across our 256 units, okay, over the next five years. Um, that means we're generating somewhere around 45% additional NOI. Now we're raising the exit cap up to that 6% to that exit cap. And so it's, it's, it's very simply just a function of where do we believe the market will be to the best of our ability five years from now. And we build in a little bit of fluff. We're locking in that long-term debt. Uh, so that we feel like a 6% exit cap somewhere between three and five years is defensible. So like that's a strong assumption. And then we're just taking the NOI over that cap and we're, we're generating a purchase price. Great. Um, and will the investment accrue interest until distributions begin? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the day the deal closes on November 19th, the preferred return clock starts. So, so your money begins generating a return the day that we close. Excellent. And given your favorable relationships, can you um, tell us if you have any favorable insurance um, relationships that you can pass on to your projects as well? <laughs> That's a great question. So uh, for my entire career, um, going back to, to Westmount, I've worked with uh, Dallas's Locked In Insurance Group. So Locked In is the largest private insurance provider for commercial real estate in the country. Uh, Locked In Insurance uh, insures our entire portfolio. So because of the scale of our operation, um, we're able to generate a significant discount on our per unit insurance cost. Regardless of whether we're investing in uh, Houston, where properties are more flood prone, or whether we're investing in Oklahoma, where you have wind uh, or tornado coverage, or you're investing in Dallas, where you have hail, um, any single market in the United States is going to have some kind of a natural disaster that the insurers are trying to insure against. Tulsa, this particular property, doesn't have any losses on their loss history. There hasn't been any issues. So we're able to lock in very favorable insurance rates because of that and because of the, the scope and scale of our operation with locked in insurance. So the, the properties have uh, what I would call best in class insurance coverage across the board from, again, the largest nationwide provider for commercial real estate. Thanks. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about your relationship between the partnership and the construction company? And if there's any assumed margin or profit being applied at the construction level? Uh, great question. Um, so Bellevue Construction Management is a wholly owned subsidiary of Nicholas Residential. There is absolutely no profit, no kickback, no additional revenue generated from Bellevue Construction Management. The construction company gets a 5% construction management fee on the budget, which is about 2% below market. Um, but there's no, there's no additional arbitrage of margin. That 17 to 22 percent uh, labor savings on top of our procurement business, which generates um, raw material savings between 30 and 40 percent, all of that is passed along to the partnership. Don't forget, our money's in the deal as well. Um, so it doesn't do us any good to overcharge 
uh, the partnership because we're in financial alignment. It's one of the reasons we structure our deal with institutional waterfalls, even at the smaller scale. We want to make sure that we are in complete financial alignment with our investors. So that's that's one of the reasons we were on the waterfall. Um, and that's the reason that we keep those margins in the deal. It benefits all of us. Remember, as a sponsorship team, if we can get you, the investor, to that 16% IRR faster, uh, that means we generate a larger percentage of the returns on the back end. And so that's our goal. Thank you. And do you know in the city of Tulsa what their rules are for evictions and recovery of bad debt? Well, recovery of bad debt is a is a separate issue from evictions. So, bad debt, um, we can we can go after an individual tenant for unpaid rent. Uh, we're not gonna we're not I'm not gonna stand here and tell you we're gonna chase a tenant for seven hundred bucks. We're just not gonna do it. It's not a good use of our time. It's not a good use of partnership resources to pursue a tenant over a seven hundred dollar unpaid monthly bill. So, uh, essentially, what a, a better use is 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 we will label on their leasing history that they're a skip okay so that means we'll have a very difficult time ever getting another apartment in the area um, we'll put it on their credit report so their credit will take a hit um, and then we'll write the bad debt off of our taxes so it'll be a write-off at the end of the day um, i don't anticipate that being an issue in this particular submarket, but that's how we would handle it on the eviction side Oklahoma is a little bit more friendly to the landlord than Texas. Texas has a history of being very tenant friendly. Um, so you have to get a writ of possession, they call it, through a court in order to evict a tenant, which can take anywhere from three to six weeks. Uh, meanwhile, you're not getting paid rent. Oklahoma, it's a little bit of a smoother process. They have a little bit less tolerance for that. Probably still a three to four week soup to nut process. You can't just you can't just bust the door down and throw people out. Okay, thanks. Um, and Paul, did you were you around during the 2008 downturn, and did you learn anything from that time period? It's a great question. Um, I was around, and I wasn't buying. <laughs> so from 2008 to 2011, um, I was not in the acquisitions market. I was working on an institutional transaction. So um, in 2007, 2008, uh, a company called Xerox purchased a Dallas-based company called Affiliated Computer Services for $5.6 billion. Um, Affiliated Computer Services is was the largest business process outsourcing solutions firm in the country. So chances are, if you run a red light today, um, and you get a picture taken of your license plate, you're going to get a ticket, and that ticket and the processing is going to come from an ACS subsidiary. So um, ACS and Xerox had a tremendous amount of international real estate, offices, and industrial centers. And so my job was to consolidate human capital, right, consolidate personnel into fewer offices, and consolidate materials into fewer industrial buildings, so we could turn around and sell those properties into the market to generate additional capital for the transaction. The one thing that we weren't doing is buying real estate. Um, that was a time where I and, and many others sat out of the market. I got back into acquisitions in 2011, um, what you could argue was the bottom, um, and have continued building back up to where we are today. And let me let me just touch on one more thing because it's a very good question and 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 I I want to expand on that. Um, the the group's institutions and there were several institutions that that got hurt during the downturn from 2009 to 2011 were the groups that could not afford to absorb what we call a paper loss. Okay, they were over leveraged. Okay, you're seeing a lot of this today, right? You're seeing three-year bridge loans at 5%, right? At 85% leverage. You're seeing it all the time, right? Sure, you're generating a 20 IRR on paper. What happens when that loan comes due in three years and you're in a very difficult refinance and sales market? You're in trouble. 
Um, you saw folks that were undercapitalizing transactions. Banks were so eager to lend. They would lend on anything. So you could lever up to 85, 90%. You almost had to put no money down. People were not properly capitalizing their budgets. They didn't have any extra income. They didn't have any extra CapEx money or contingency sitting in their bank account. So when the downturn hit, they didn't have a choice. Their loan came due, okay? So they either had to sell or they had to refinance, okay? We never, ever want to be in a similar situation. So we use long-term debt, okay? We're using 10-year debt for a reason. Number one, it's very attractive when we go to sell the property. Number two, it gives us that leeway. If five years from now, we're at the bottom of the market, we don't have to sell. We don't have to refinance as long as we can make debt service. And that's one of the reasons that we overcapitalize our budgets, right? As long as we can hit our debt service number, we live to fight another day. And the groups that were able to survive the downturn because they had properly capitalized their debt and their equity, they were able to come out in 2013, 2014, 2015 and make their money back. It's just like when you buy a stock and the stock loses value, you don't realize that loss unless you sell the stock. So if you hang on and that stock recovers, down the road, you end up realizing a gain on your investment. It's the same thing in real estate, right? Only here, you've got folks that are using short-term debt as a way to manufacture returns. That's a big mistake. Uh, it's something that we've refused to do from the onset. We don't use PREF equity. We don't use mezzanine debt. Um, and unless there's an unbelievably compelling reason, like a core infill trophy asset that we're going to hold for a long time, uh, we don't use bridge loans either. 95% of our debt is long-term fixed rate, so we remove interest rate risk, agency financing. Thanks for that explanation, Paul. Um, can you go back to your upgrade uh, levels? Sounds like you do 5% at level two. Can you tell us what it is at level one and if there's no upgrade? Well, 5% is, is a generic number, right? That's pretty typical for the portfolio. It can range from 5 to 15% depending on the market's response. Um, I don't know if I understood your question on, on a no upgrade. I mean, a no upgrade is, is pretty simple, right? It's, we're not spending any money. Um, we'll look to get a, maybe a $25 rent premium to bring that unit a little bit closer to market. Uh, but other than a $650 turnover expense, there's, there's really no capital put into that unit. Um, the tier one, it's a plank full wood floor throughout the entire uh, property, bottom and, and second floor. It's a formica, which is a, um, it's, it's, it, it mimics granite, but it's a laminate over a particle board. Okay, so it's less expensive. It's very, very durable. So we use a formica countertop and a formica cabinet front. We like the brush nickel aluminum accents. So the door handles, the pull knobs on the drawers, the pull knobs on the cabinets. We use a black appliance package. Um, we upgrade the lighting to either a track lighting or an LED package. Same thing with the fans. We have a two-tone paint. Um, it's a white and then sort of a white with a little tinge of a gray called Nebulous that we use in our units. It's pretty universal. We use a faux wood two-inch blind, and we use gooseneck faucets um, in the kitchen areas. That package, again, uh, anywhere from $2,750 to $3,000. Uh, depending on the size and square footage of the unit. Typically, we'll do 80% of a property with that package. Um, the Tier 2 package is everything that I just mentioned, uh, with the addition of the pre-cut granite countertops in both the kitchen and the bathroom. We do the undermount sink, which is a requirement if you're using granite. Uh, you got to have an undermount sink. We'll do a tile backsplash and a stainless steel appliance package. What we're looking for is we're looking for the height of the market, okay? So if we're getting $75 for a $3,000 package, 
but we're getting $150 for a $4,000 package, then we'll probably do a couple of more $4,000 packages. If we're topped out at 100 bucks, then we'll sort of reformat what our improvement package looks like to maximize return to the partnership. We do not want to over improve units because there's a ceiling, right? There's a limit to what people can afford. It's one of the reasons that we look for submarkets that have very strong demographics, good employment, good average income, absorbing a $75 rent bump in this market when you're already $120 below market. Very, very achievable assumption. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us what date funds are due? Uh, Megan, I think we've got that on, on the portal, and I don't recall off the top of my head what date that we sent, um, but I think it's it's just before it, the end of the month, correct? Yeah, I think so. I, I can't remember either, but it is on the portal. You can find it on the right side in the box with all the uh, summary information. Um, and, and Paul, can you tell us what some of your historic IRRs have been on your sold projects? Yeah, I, I don't like um, I, I don't like this question because our historical IRRs factor in deals that I bought at the bottom of the market in 2011. I do not want anyone on this call to think that they're going to get a 36% return. You're not. Um, you're going to get a 17 or an 18% return. Um, but historically, our IRRs are 36.4%. Are um, again, caveat that, that includes deals that I bought in 11, 12, 13 from the bank on an REO basis that were generating you know, 45% IRRs. That is not where the market's at today. The market's exactly uh, where we think it is, and that's in that 17, 18% range. Um, which, again, is a tremendous risk-adjusted return on these assets. All right. Thank you. Um, and can you do us a favor and give a high-level overview of the properties you mentioned in your track record and how they're performing today? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm happy to provide a track record um, to anybody that would request one. Um, I've purchased, you know, 8,000 units. Um, what I'll tell you is we've, we've never had a capital call. Um, we have never sold a deal that generated an IRR below 15%. Um, so typically our deals generate anywhere from a 17 all the way up to a 40% return. Um, cash flow, you know, depending on the timing and the performance of the assets, how old they are, uh, how much they've turned, they can generate anywhere from a 5% monthly distribution all the way up to a, you know, 13% monthly distribution. All right, thank you. I think that will wrap up our session today. I want to thank everyone for joining us and remind you that if you have any follow-up questions for CrowdStreet, you can ask them through the questions button from the CrowdStreet detail page, or you can send us an email at ir at crowdstreet.com, and we will respond to you right away. Um, after this webinar, the transaction will open for uh, investments, and we will get the webinar posted uh, later on today. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Megan.